probably going to be working a top one. That's not going to be able to help you in your old age. Social Security would be gone by then. I finished high school a year and a half early. That's how much I, I, I couldn't stand this. It is just a, a great deal of, of time being wasted. I took college classes, summer classes, night classes, and I got out of high school quite quickly. I then went to a trade school and finished a trade school in audio engineering. The time I had done this, I had only turned 18. I already had a trade school degree and a high school diploma. I was already doing more than my family had achieved, more than my mother and father had achieved, but I still lacked discipline. I still lacked order. Just because I turned 18 didn't mean I was an adult. I didn't feel like an adult. I still felt like a kid. I still felt young at heart. I still behaved like a child. I still felt like a child. I wanted to grow up. I wanted to be more. I knew that I had a brain. I knew that I was intelligent. I just was lazy. I was a privileged white kid growing up in middle class America. I never had to work hard for anything. I was lazy. And I wanted that oomph. I wanted that push forward. I wanted to become an adult. Now back in 2002, I didn't have many options. I didn't come from a privileged family. We couldn't afford the money to send me to something like Arizona State or, or Georgetown or some wonderful school. So my options were relatively limited. I could work at Taco Bell or be homeless. That was the career options that I had. And as I was sitting at home one night, channel surfing, I hear a commercial that says, be all that you can be. And it was like a light bulb was going off over my head. That was what I was looking for. That was what I needed. I needed to be all that I could be. I needed to grow up. I needed to step up. I needed to mature, reach that adult phase. Be all that I could be. Whoever thought of that slogan, I hope to God that that guy got at least a $2,000, $3,000 bonus that month. Because I guarantee you thousands of people enlisted from that one slogan alone. Be all that you can be. It's simple, it rhymes, it's easy to remember. It's impossible to forget. I woke up the next morning, I was singing that song in the shower. As I'm sitting there washing up, I'm singing, be all that you can be. It all made sense. I was going to go to the army. This was the good thing. This was a good idea. It always looked good on a job application. It always looked good on a resume. It would secure me a career for the rest of my life. I'm going to the army. Prepared my documents. I got my high school diploma, my birth certificate, my college degree. Went to the recruiters. I walked in and said, hey guys, I want to join the army. And the recruiters looked at me and they kind of laughed. And they said, that's okay. We don't need you. Have a good day. I was a little confused. Walked outside, I lit up a cigarette, and I started thinking to myself, we had that whole 9 11 thing happen, we're going to war with Iraq. We haven't figured that out now, it's been 13 years, but Iraq had something to do with it, so we're going to war with Iraq, obviously we're going to need soldiers. Why did the recruiter say no to me? I know I'm an American citizen, I graduated high school, I have a degree, you know, what's wrong? Why did he say no? And when I got home, I looked in the mirror and I realized that perhaps having blue hair and being covered in tattoos as I was and having the piercings that I did wasn't what the army was looking for. You see, back in 2002, all of the cool kids were joining the military. As a result of 9 11, there was a great deal of patriotism in this country. False patriotism, but a great deal of patriotism. If you didn't have the money to go to college, you joined the service. Some people who had the money to go to college willingly joined the service because they wanted to go and fight. They wanted to go and, and serve their country and defend their country. This is what all of the cool kids were doing. So the recruiter looked and he said, why would I take this guy, this rebel, this blue-haired, tattooed, weird kid, why would I take him? If I just wait a couple more hours, I'm going to get somebody from the football team or somebody from the basketball team or the baseball team. I'm going to get a natural athlete. Athletes make better killers. Athletes make better warriors. I'll wait for one of them. I'm not going to take this kid. He looks like trouble. Well, my options were limited. That Taco Bell job started getting worse and worse as days were going by. Came back a week later and I said, hey, I want to join the army. They said, that's okay, we, we still don't need you. Stop coming here. Went home, shaved my head, bought a long sleeve shirt, took out some of my piercings, came back a week later. Hey, I want to join the army. Yeah, we know you want to join the army. What do you want to do with me? I want to kill people and get paid for it. Why does anybody join the army? I grew up watching G.I. Joe. That's what you do. That's okay. We still don't need you. Fourth time, I go to the recruiters. It took me a month. Fourth time, I go to the recruiters. Hey, guys. You know the drill. I want to join the army. 
listen, kid, we don't want you. You look like a liability. You look like a chance. You look like a risk. I don't think you're that bright. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go downtown. I'm going to let you take your ASVAB. If you score well enough on your ASVAB, we'll talk about your options. But if you don't score well enough, you have to leave me alone. For those of you who don't know, the ASVAB is a government standardized test that allows for the government to figure out how they can best exploit you. If you take this test and you score poorly, they'll make you a mechanic or stick you in a motor pool. If you score well, they'll make you into an uh, interrogator or a linguist. If you score very well, if you score high, they'll make you into a pilot, a physicist, a, a, a neurosurgeon. There's 212 different careers that you can serve in the United States military. I don't know what I scored on that test. But he took me downtown, he dropped me off, I went out to dinner afterwards, I came home, and by the time I got home from eating dinner, I had two missed calls from my recruiter. He wanted to take me out for breakfast the next morning and discuss my options. I picked, he picked me up, we went out for breakfast, he took me out to a resort, we had a $60 breakfast. I don't know how we managed to spend $60 on breakfast. I mean, eggs, toast, and cantaloupe, how can you, how, how does this come to $60? Arizona has lots of resorts, very expensive resorts. We have more resorts than any other state in the United States, as a matter of fact. He was whining and dining. He told me that I had scored very well, that I had a great deal of career options available to me. He wanted me to come into the office that afternoon and talk with him. When I came into the office and I sat down, he asked me if I was a basketball fan. I said, uh, kind of, why? He's like, oh, you know, I got some courtside tickets to see the Lakers playing against you know, the Suns in the playoffs tonight if you want to go. Really? Free courtside tickets? Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll take that right on. We started talking. We discussed my options. We discussed how I did on the exam. He told me that I had every career as an option. He told me that I need to think seriously. What is it that you want to do? What do you want to do in this army? How do you want to serve Uncle Sam? Well, I still didn't have much of a better answer than kill people and get paid for it. So I made the mistake of asking my recruiter what job is giving a bonus. When you ask a military recruiter what job is giving a bonus, that's about the sweetest words that they can possibly hear. If somebody looking like me without a beard came walking in right now and said, hey guys, I want to become a Muslim, what do I do? I mean, could, could there be anything better that we could hear? I want to be a Muslim. That would be great. We would all turn, we'd go running. No, brother, just say, Isha, Hada, Isha, no, 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 you'd be a Muslim, it'd be good for you. We'd be happy about this. That's what it's like for a recruiter. When you tell a recruiter what job is giving a bonus, that's what they hear. They feel good. That's the best ones. For a $2,000 bonus, I became a military police officer in the United States Army. I had no interest in being a police officer. I don't like police officers. I'm petrified of police officers and TSA agents, and FBI agents, and CIA agents, and the NSA, or Verizon NSA, because Verizon and NSA have a partnering agreement, so I don't like them too much either. Anybody with a badge and a uniform makes me uncomfortable. They, they, they scare me. Because I know what happens when you give a small person a badge and a uniform. Bad things happen. And I'm going to discuss that in great length. I joined the Army in August of 2002 roughly a year after 9-11. I finished basic training in December of 2002. I was stationed in Fort Leonard Wood. I married my first wife in March of 2003. In May of 2003, I found out that I was going to Guantanamo. I didn't think to myself to go home and Google Guantanamo, and if I did, I probably would have spelled it wrong. 98% of Americans put an I in Guantanamo. I don't know why. It's a Spanish word. It's pretty simple to spell, but they put an I in it, and I don't think that I'm smarter than 98% of Americans, so I probably would have spelled it wrong as well. If I had bothered to search for it, I wouldn't have found anything. Guantanamo wasn't in the news back in 2003. Guantanamo didn't exist as far as the media is concerned in 2003. So there would have been nothing on the internet. I would have found nothing. I trusted that my army, my country, would teach me everything that I need to know about how to work in Guantanamo, what to expect, who these people are. They wouldn't send me into a hostile situation without preparing me. That's just not how the military works. So I put my faith in the Army, and I decided with that little bit of time that I had left, it would be best to invest all the time I could with my wife. I wanted to make sure that I would come home to a stable marriage. I wanted to make sure that I would come home to a wife. She had given up her life in Arizona. She had given up her friends, her family, 
moved halfway across the country to Fort Lundwood, Missouri, which is the methamphetamine capital of the US. She knew no one. She was going to be alone for a year. I felt horrible about it. I wanted to make sure that she would be there when I got back. We conducted our training in Fort Dix, New Jersey. I mentioned the location for a number of reasons. Uh, has anybody ever seen Jersey Shore on MTV? Usually people don't admit to this. <laughs> <laughs> don't feel bad. It's just, I can ask that question even when we're in Newark and nobody raises their hand. It's like, come on, we're in Newark. None of you guys have seen Jersey Shore? Oh, What's the mm -hmm. name again? Jersey Shore on MTV. For snooky it is. <laughs> we're conducting this training in Fort Dix, New Jersey. And, and as we're conducting this training, we don't have any criminals to train with. Now, I've seen Jersey Shore. I know there's plenty of criminals in Jersey. It's loaded with criminals. But we didn't have any criminals. So for half the day, when we were conducting the training, I would play the role of the detainee. And for half the day, I would play the role of the police officer. Fort Dix, New Jersey doesn't have a correctional facility. So we were training in a fake facility we made out of plastic pipes and PVC. We didn't have the manual from Guantanamo, because if that manual were to leave the island, if it were to fall into the hands of the media or the wrong people, it would justify and prove that Guantanamo existed, which is something the media definitely wanted, but the government did not want. So we were using the manual for Fort Knox. Now, those of you who have ever heard of Fort Knox, Fort Knox has money, not people. The individuals who were training us had never been to Guantanamo. They didn't know the first thing about the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, they didn't know anything about al-Shabaab. They didn't know who the Mujahideen were. They didn't know any of these words. This was totally foreign concepts to them. So let's review. Training in Fort Dix, New Jersey in a fake facility with no criminals, with the wrong manual, with people who had never been to Guantanamo. Needless to say, the Army did not do that great of a job of preparing us as how to do our job when we arrived in Guantanamo. Now, when it came to the cultural aspect, when it came to what to expect with regards to Islam, this is distinctly different altogether. The army told us everything we needed to know about Islam. The army taught us everything we needed to know about Al-Qaeda and about the Taliban. Whenever a group of soldiers would be together, say three soldiers, that, that comprises a team, three soldiers. Whenever there was a team of soldiers together, the team leader or somebody in leadership would be addressing them. Do not be complacent when we get in Guantanamo. Guantanamo is full of the worst of the worst. It is full of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. These people hate you and they will kill you. They hate you because you're white. They hate you because you're an American. Do not be complacent. Maybe all of the teams are together. Maybe they're having a squad meeting. Three teams are composed of a squad, so there would be a squad leader. A squad leader would give a similar talk. Do not be complacent when we get to Guantanamo. This is the worst of the worst in Al-Qaeda. These people hate you for the freedoms that you have. They hate you because of the color of your skin. They hate you because of what you believe. They hate you because you love Jesus. Do not be complacent when we get to Guantanamo. Every morning we would have an accountability formation. This is when the entire company would be together. All the soldiers, all the leadership. And at that point in time, our first sergeant would usually come up and he would tell us, do not be complacent when we get to Guantanamo. It is the worst of the worst. It is Al-Qaeda. It is the Taliban and the Mujahideen. These are not men, these are terrorists. These are animals. These are lower than animals. These people hate you and hate everything that you stand for. Remember 9-11, remember what happened. When we get to Guantanamo, do not be complacent and do not hesitate. Do not feel sympathy or compassion. These are dirt farmers, these are towel heads, these are sand makers. They will not stop at anything to kill you. They hate everything about you. Do not be complacent. The army taught me everything that I needed to know about Islam to work in Guantanamo. That was all that I needed to know. We get on the plane to leave from Fort Dix, New Jersey to fly down to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, which for all intent and purpose should have been around a nine, ten hour flight. We landed 45 minutes later. I was a little confused. There's no way we possibly made it to Cuba in 45 minutes. We get off the plane, we look around, and there's all these tall buildings, and it's smoggy and dirty, and there's a lot of food on every corner. And it turns out we were in New York City. Our commander had arranged for us to go to Ground Zero that day. He went to Ground Zero to be the last piece of American soil that we saw. 
He wanted us to walk around and read the comments written on the walls, to see the rubble, to see the destruction and the damage, to see the candles and the flowers and the photographs. He wanted us to really soak it in. And as we were getting back on the plane, he reiterated what we had heard many times before. Do not be complacent, men. When we get to Guantanamo, I want you to remember what you saw here today. When we get to Guantanamo, I want you to remember how you feel. When we get to Guantanamo, I want you to remember who we are defending. Think of your wives and your children, your family at home. When we get to Guantanamo, I want you to remember the 3,000 innocent Americans that died here for no reason. When we get to Guantanamo, I want you to remember what this song did to us here. As we were flying down to Guantanamo, I started envisioning what these men were going to look like. I started thinking about what these men were going to look like. I didn't really have a, a fundamental concept of the Mujahideen, the Taliban, Al Qaeda. I didn't know who these people were. I had images from Fox, images from CNN, and, and a little bit of knowledge the army had given me. In my mind, I was picturing these men with prolific beards and giant swords, and they were all going to be on horseback. No matter what way they would turn their head, the wind would always be blowing into their beard. I was expecting Charleston Heston and Anthony Quinn. That's what I was thinking I was going to get when we landed in Guantanamo. What I got was distinctly different. We landed, and as we were coming off the plane, the very first thing to hit you is the realization that you are under the Tropic of Cancer. It is hot. Guantanamo is about 100 degrees year-round with 100% humidity, oceanfront property. Make no mistake about it, it is hot. The next thing that hits you is the smell of Guantanamo particularly the smell of Camp Delta. You can be about 50, maybe 75 feet away from Camp Delta when you start to smell the camp. Camp Delta is where the majority of the detainees are housed. 780 Muslim men from 46 different countries. Now most of these men, if they're lucky, get to shower once every two weeks. If they misbehave in the slightest, the very first privilege should be taken away from them is the right to shower. We do this in Guantanamo, we take away the right to shower, so that if a detainee needs to make chusl and he can't, then the detainee can't pray. If the detainee can't pray, then we break his spirit, we break his deen. And if we break his deen, he will share with us all the knowledge that he knows. He will tell us where the weapons are, he'll tell us where the training facilities are, he'll tell us where the leaders are, he'll tell us where the caves are. This is the information that we want, and this is the way that we go about getting it. The smallest infraction, the slightest breaking of a rule, you even look at a guard the wrong way, the first privilege you lose is your shower privilege. Many of the detainees shower once a month. If they are fortunate, they shower twice a month. So you have 780 men who are not being allowed to bathe. These men are living in 100 degree temperature, 100 degree humidity, and for lack of a better description, they're cages, they're kennels. Camp Delta is really nothing more than, than kennels. It's aluminum siding and concrete blocks. I don't know where the billions of dollars that we've invested have gone to, because it certainly didn't go into building this facility. These men are cooking in these cages 24 hours a day. Being that they get to shower twice a week and they're cooking 24 hours a day, they smell. You can smell Camp Delta from a good 75 feet away. You add on top of that that each block that the detainees are living on doesn't have running sewage in Camp Delta. There are PVC pipes that run underneath the toilets at about a 75 degree angle. The idea is that the, that the urine and feces will drip down to the end where it will gather in a collection tank, and that collection tank can be taken out once a week. However, that's not what usually happens. After a couple of detainees use the restroom, usually those pipes start to clog. They start to back up. So then you have a week's worth of urine and feces that's starting to cook along with the detainees that are smelling. Then you have the military working dogs. Dogs don't particularly care where they go to the restroom. They're going to go to the restroom when they have to go to the restroom. And of course, the guard isn't going to come and pick it up. He doesn't feel it's his responsibility. If this should have been the canine guy. The canine unit should have picked it up. The canine unit isn't going to pick it up because he's more concerned about his dog and using his dog to interrogate and, and to, to intimidate the detainees. So nobody goes and cleans up this dog poop or this dog urine. So you have this dog poop, dog urine. You have these men. And then you have the running sewage issue. It smells. It adds on top of itself. When we have to forcefully extract a detainee from a cell, which happens often, at least five times a day, we use somewhere between half a can to an entire can of pepper spray on a detainee. 
The concept is essentially cover a detainee from head to toe in pepper spray. Everything in the surrounding environment, and if you should happen to feel so inclined, spray a little on his Quran too, so that way his Quran will no longer be readable, no longer be useful to him. So you have that lingering smell. You have all these smells that come together. When you get into that 75 foot, zo foot zone, you start smelling Camp Delta. And I'll tell you, it takes weeks to adjust that smell. The first few weeks when I would come home from work, I would literally use an entire bottle of shampoo just to try to wash the smell off of me. It doesn't go. It does not go away. It lingers. It stinks. It burns your eyes. Now, the second thing that hit me as we were walking into Camp Delta, aside from the smell, was the sound of Camp Delta. We had 780 Muslim men from 46 different countries all around the world speaking 18 given languages at any time. You've got Arabic and Urdu, Pashto, Uyghur, Punjabi, Farsi, Indonesian, Malaysian, German, French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Swedish, and uh, I don't know, a couple smaller ones in between, but we don't need to get into it. None of them were speaking English. That was my problem. Nobody spoke English. I live in America. I can barely speak English. None of the detainees spoke English. As we were going through this tour, we're seeing these men. We're seeing these men that are in these shackles. We're seeing these men that are being tortured and abused. They're being yelled at. They're being degraded. And I start hearing something familiar as we're walking down one of these blocks. It sounds like a song that I've heard in the past. And as we walk onto the block, I realize that it was a detainee who was singing Eminem. From the top of his lungs, this detainee was singing Eminem. And it went contrary to everything that I knew about Islam. Now, at that point in time, I thought to myself, wait a second, hold on. Muslims hate America. Muslims hate white people. Muslims hate freedom. Muslims hate Christianity. Muslims hate music. Muslims hate everything that's fun about life. What's this guy doing rapping? I mean, certainly he can't be rapping. Muslims have to hate rap music if they hate all these other things. So as we pass by a cell, I ask him, hey, you, what are you doing rapping? You're not allowed to rap. You're a Muslim. You guys hate rap, you hate music, you hate freedom and all the good stuff about life. What are you doing rapping? I wanted an answer. I wanted to know, why are you rapping? And in broken English, he explains to me, when he goes to interrogation, the interrogator will play the same song on repeat for six hours, 12 hours, maybe 18 hours, however long until he defecates himself. And once he defecates himself, the interrogation begins. I came to learn he was part of a sensory deprivation, sensory stimulation interrogation. What this means is that he would be taken into the interrogation room and he'd be shackled to the ground in a stress position. This position is meant to induce muscle atrophy, muscle failure. As he is left in this position, there would be a strobe light put in front of his face that would be in no way, shape, or form he could turn his head well enough to not see. They'd be blasting horrible music whether it was Slayer, Godsmack, DSI, Cannibal Corpse, uh, Eminem, Celine Dion, Disney soundtracks, whatever it was used was being used on repeat for the entirety that this would happen. He'd be left in this position with this music, with the air conditioner set to 40, being covered in a bucket of cold water periodically to create such an environmental stimulation that his body would ultimately shut down and he would defecate or urinate himself. And when that would happen, the interrogator would come into the room and emasculate him, and put him down, tell him how he wasn't worthy of fighting for the Mujahideen, tell him about how he wasn't worthy of fighting the cause of Allah because he just defecated himself like a child. And that's when the interrogation would start. This had been happening to him for years when I arrived in Guantanamo. His idea was that if he learned the words to all of these songs, which isn't very difficult to do. You listen to the same song for 18 hours, you're going to know the words. If he learned the words to all of these songs and started seeing them when he went to interrogation, the interrogator would get upset. The interrogator would realize that it wasn't working. He went to interrogation a few days later, he started singing Eminem, the interrogator got very upset. The interrogator punched him a few times, kicked him in the ribs, punched him in the stomach, sent him back to the block and said, that's it, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. We're done, we're gonna find something else to do. So the plan worked. The interrogator stopped using that method. Unfortunately for the detainees in Guantanamo, that lovely Donald Rumsfeld who we were discussing earlier, Skeletor, <laughs> that you guys might not get that, it's a He-Man joke, you have to be at least 30 to get this one, Skeletor. 
Donald Rumsfeld, when he wrote the manual for Guantanamo, the SOP, he wrote it in very gray terminology. What I mean by this is, um, well, let me just give you an example. It is acceptable to use any phobia that you may find from a detainee to exploit that phobia for the purpose of intelligence gathering during interrogation. Can somebody tell me what I just said? You can scare them in any way in order to get the information. To what limit? To limit that as long as it scares them, you can use it. There is no limit. Precisely. There is no limit written within that definition. So if a detainee is afraid of cockroaches, the detainee is afraid of spiders, the detainee is afraid of snakes. It is okay to chain a detainee to a ground or to a chair or, or to put him in some type of a restricting device and cover him in cockroaches or cover him in snakes or cover him in scorpions. If a detainee is afraid of the dark, it is acceptable to leave him in the dark for hours while he screams in terror. If a detainee is afraid of confined spaces, if he is claustrophobic, it would not be unheard of, it would not be a stretch of the imagination for a detainee to be left in a coffin for hours upon hours. This is acceptable interrogation policy in Guantanamo. Now, as we were doing these things, as I was doing these things to detainees, I started thinking to myself, this isn't right. This isn't the America that I signed up to defend. This isn't how we behave. We have the best legal system in the world. We have the best ethics in the world. We have the best morals. We're the most superior country. We have democracy and we have freedom. We have this, we have that. We've been going around the world delivering democracy to all these people and freeing them and helping them. That standard and culture of youth that American children receive, being taught that we are the best. What we were doing in Guantanamo was antithetical to what I had been taught. Nothing about what we were doing there was the best. Nothing about it was acceptable. Three months in, I started voicing my concerns. I started talking to my team leader. I said, hey, Sergeant, I can't do this. I need some days off. I need some time away. I can't do this. I can't keep coming in and doing this each day. This isn't us. This isn't America. This isn't how we should behave. It says U.S. Army. I, I don't feel proud about this. This isn't something that I'm happy to be doing. I need some time down. He says, you know what? Why don't you come to my place after we get off of work? We'll have a few beers. We'll talk about it. You'll feel better. Standard Army answer. Have a few beers. You'll feel better. A couple of weeks went by. I didn't feel better. I went to my next level of leadership. I went to my platoon sergeant. Sergeant, you know, I, I can't deal with this. I'm, I'm starting to think about suicide. I'm not happy. I need to get out of this environment. This place is miserable. It's dreaming me down. It's draining me. I need some help. What can I do? Please help me. This is not us. This is not how we should be behaving. He looks at me and he goes, Holbrooks, uh, you've been in the Army for what, five months now? You're still kind of wet behind the ears. And this gets easier over time. What we're doing gets easier over time. You just have to remember they're the ones who started it. Islam started it. We're the ones who are going to end it. Go home, have a few beers, walk it off. A couple more weeks go by. I go to the commander. Commander, I need to go to the doctor. I need to go to mental health. I can't deal with this. I am seriously contemplating suicide. I am thinking about it day after day. I don't want to go to work anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. This is not us. This is not America. This is wrong. He asked me a question. If I were to send you to the doctor, how could I say no to sending him to the doctor, and him to the doctor, and him to the doctor? You think you're the only person here who's having a hard time dealing with this? You think you're the only one who's having a, a bit of a struggle, a bit of a doubt? I can't send you to the doctor. If I send you to the doctor, I've got to send everyone. And then half my unit will be gone, and then we can't accomplish the mission. Why don't you go home, have a beer? Drive on. Standard Army answer. Have a beer, drive on. Within three months of being in Guantanamo, 75% of my unit was an alcoholic. We had all become alcoholics. We had become alcoholics because we needed to drink to sleep. We needed to drink to not have nightmares. We needed to drink to escape our guilt. We needed to drink to escape our shame and the grief and the misery that we were carrying with us. And we would do this day after day after day. Three months into Guantanamo, my entire unit was miserable. Those of us who were alcoholics and those of us who weren't, we were all miserable. 
We only had to go to work for eight hours a day. After that eight hours, we could leave. We weren't being tortured and abused. We could go home and shower, we could bathe, we could eat whatever we wanted, we could watch whatever we wanted, we could play video games, watch movies, distract ourselves, free our minds. But we were all miserable. And then I go to work and I see these detainees. They're being tortured and abused. They're having these horrible things done to them. But they're still getting up and praying. They're still getting up and believing that somewhere in this universe there's a God that cares about them. Somewhere in this world, somewhere in this, this infinite creation, there's a God and God wants good things for them. It blew my mind that you're in Guantanamo. You're going to die here. How can you possibly think that there's a God that cares about you? I was agnostic. I believed in a God. I did not believe that God cared about me. I decided that I was going to start asking the detainees, how can you believe that God cares about you? How can you possibly believe it? I knew about maybe five, six guys at this point who spoke English well enough that I could talk with them. I went and asked the first one, why do you wake up and pray each day? Why do you think that God cares about you? And he tells me that it was just a law of testing his knee. I didn't understand that answer. I didn't really understand the concept of being. I still wasn't quite clear on who a law was. But he told me this was just a law of testing his being. I understood that it was something testing him. Okay. I asked another detainee, how can you wake up and pray and go through this each day? You know, you're getting tortured and abused. You, your, your Quran was thrown in the toilet and, and, and these horrible things are happening to you. How can you possibly go through this and think that God cares about you? He tells me that it's just God testing his strength, testing his faith. I understood that answer. I asked another detainee. He said that it was just God testing his will, testing how much he could take, how much he could endure. I asked another detainee. He told me there were people who came before him, generations of people who had come before him, who had had it worse than him, and that if they could deal with it, he could deal with it. That if this was his test, he could take it and to bring it on. That rocked me. Bring it on. To say to a guard in Guantanamo, if this is the worst you have, bring it on. I started thinking to myself, maybe there's something more to this this song than what the army told me. Maybe there's something more to this song than what CNN and Fox told me. If these guys can be tortured and abused on a daily basis, and they still get up and pray and think that God cares about them, maybe there's something more to this song. I want that. They're happy. They've got peace. They're talking with each other. They're keeping each other motivated. They're keeping each other going day after day. I want that. People on our own? No, we're miserable. We hate this. We hate our lives. We can't think about anything except for getting away from here. And they just want to wake up and pray? I want that. So I started at, you know, square one. All the questions that you asked me, you know nothing about this song. Why do you guys pray so much? You, know, you woke up in the morning and you guys prayed, and then like, the afternoon came and you prayed, and then you were praying throughout the afternoon, praying into the evening. Did you forget what you were praying for in the morning? So then you prayed again, and then you forgot it again, so you prayed again. Just write down, and then you won't have to pray so much. Why are you guys always praying that way? What's that way? Are, are, are you praying to that box? Do you think that that box is God? Do you think that God lives in that box? Do you even believe in God? Why is it when we talk, you can speak English, but then when you pray, you pray in that other language? That detainee over there, he doesn't speak the language that you speak, but you guys speak the same language when you pray. Why do you guys pray five times every day? Why do you always wash before you pray? What's that about? Why, why don't you guys eat pork? Why don't you drink? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Think of the questions you would have if you were not born a Muslim. Think of the questions you would have if Islam had not been something that had been in your life your entire life. Those are the questions that I had. What's up? Why is that person not here listening to this lecture? <laughs> they better not be smoking hookah. <laughs> Think of the questions that you would have if you knew nothing about this song. Those are the questions that I had. And the detainees wouldn't get upset with me for asking questions. They didn't get offended that I was asking them questions. They didn't get annoyed that I was asking them questions. They would answer the question and go about their day. Why do you pray that way? Because that's the correct of the Kaaba. What? What's the Kaaba? You said it, the box. Okay. Why, why, why do you pray five times? Because we're supposed to pray five times. Okay. 
But why do you pray in this language and he prayed in that language, but you guys speak different languages all the rest of the day? Because we're supposed to pray in Arabic. Well, why? And I would ask these questions and they would answer them. They wouldn't get angry or upset. They would just answer the question and go about their day. They wouldn't go into da'wah mode. They wouldn't go and tell me about how I should become a Muslim. Oh, brother, you, you should say your shahada. You should become a Muslim. It'd be good for you if only you knew. No, 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 no. They wouldn't do anything like that. They would just answer the question and go about their business. Because they didn't care if I became a Muslim or not. They just wanted to wake up and live their deen. If they could wake up that day and make their five prayers, it was a good day. That's all that they needed. That's all that they wanted, was to wake up and make that five prayers. They could be tortured and abused. They could be stuck in a coffin. They could have insects crawling on them. They could be defecating themselves. They could be covered in pepper spray. They could be shown photos of women whose heads had just recently been blown off and be told, your wife is dead. If you want to go home and bury her, tell us the information and we'll send you home. They can be shown photos of children who have been decapitated, children who have been maimed and injured and walked on explosions and landmines and be told your children are dead, your family's dead. If you want to go home and take care of your affairs, tell us your information and we'll send you home. They can go through this day after day after day. And as long as they can get up and pray, that was all that they needed. One particular detainee who I've been having very long conversations with, a brother by the name of Ahmed Yerchi, he was a Moroccan-born detainee. Mark my words, when we're done and we're asking questions, somebody's going to ask me where was uh, Ahmed Erechidi from. He was a Moroccan-born detainee. Ahmed asked me to open up the bean hole in his cell. I was like, I, I can't open up the bean hole. It's, it's not time for food. We're not changing laundry. Why would I open up the bean hole? The bean hole is about this big. It's where we serve food and enter a door or exchange laundry or anything we have to give or take from a detainee. He tells me that he wants to give me the Qur'an. I didn't have an interest in that. I, I didn't want to take the Qur'an home. I was happy just asking questions and getting answers. But he tells me to take it home and read it. He says it will answer my questions. It will help me understand. It will give me a better perspective about things. So I look to my left. There weren't any guards. I look to my right. There weren't any guards. All right. Yeah, okay, we can do this. I open it up. I take the Qur'an. I, I put it underneath my, my, my blouse. Go walk around the block, I put it in my backpack. I took it home, and I started reading it that night. What motivated me to read it was that in Guantanamo, you receive one Quran when you arrive. They ask you what language you speak, and you receive a Quran in that language. If something happens to that Quran, you do not get another one. If a dog chews on it or urinates on it, you do not get another one. If an interrogator steps on it or sets it on fire, you don't get another one. If a detainee accidentally tosses it on the ground or falls under the toilet or, or somebody throws it under the toilet intentionally or even worse, you do not get another one. And as I mentioned with the pepper spray, when your Quran gets covered in pepper spray, you do not receive another one. There's one Quran for every detainee, and that's it. For him to give me the Quran, in my mind, meant that he was going to die without a Quran. It meant that much to him that I read it. So I started reading it. Read it the first night, and I enjoyed it. Read it the second night, and I enjoyed it. Read it the third night, and I enjoyed it. It was the third night when I was reading it that I came to this realization. It was the first time I had ever read a religious book in my life that made sense. From the beginning to the end, the Quran is the easiest religious book to read. It is an instruction manual for living. There's no mysticism or magic or fairy tales or man-made nonsense. Just instructions. Here's you, here's Jannah. Here's how to get there. Easiest religious book, hands down. Once I had finished reading it, I decided that I wanted to take this song for a test drive. I wanted to try it out. I wasn't ready to become a Muslim yet, but I knew more about it. I wanted to take it for a test drive. First habit that I tried to change in my life was the amount that I was drinking. I stopped drinking a bottle of vodka each night after I got off of work. And I started waking up without a hangover. And as soon as I started waking up without a hangover and going to work and being able to think clearly and, and, and deal with what we were doing, it dawns on me. That's why those Muslims don't drink. I get it. That's why it says, you know, that's it. I get it. You don't drink. You think. You feel better. You live better. That's why those Muslims don't drink. Next habit I changed was I tried to stop smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. I tried to just cut it down to a few, you know, when I was having a really bad day, a really stressful day, maybe just have one or two cigarettes, but not two packs. 
cut my smoking down, I start running faster. I start feeling better. I can do more push-ups. I can run two miles more quickly. My PT score improves. I end up getting promoted. I get it. That's why those awesome don't smoke. You don't smoke, you're more healthy, you can do better, you're better physical fitness. That's why those Muslims don't smoke. That's why some of the Muslims don't smoke. <laughs> they got it going, I get it. That, man, I'm, I'm liking this. Change your diet, you know? Stop having a steak and ribs for dinner. Stop having three bacon eaters. Stop having a meat lover's pizza. Stop having all of the food that I was eating. And maybe have vegetables, maybe have fruit. Maybe take care of yourself, you know? Drink the right amount of water, get a good amount of sleep. Think about things that are healthy instead of all the negativity that I've been obsessing and consuming myself with. Each one of these steps that I was taking towards the psalm, my life was getting better. I was feeling better. Each one of these steps that I was taking towards the psalm, Allah was taking many steps towards me. Finally, December, we've been there for six months. December comes and I decided that I wanted to become a Muslim. I didn't know how to become a Muslim. I didn't know what I had to do to become a Muslim. I just knew that I wanted to be a Muslim. I've been living like a Muslim would live for two months maybe at that point, and, and it felt right, it felt natural. It felt like the way things are supposed to be. I wanted to be a Muslim. I decided I wanted to find Brother Irachi. I wanted him to help me. I wanted to become a Muslim, and I wanted him to teach me what I had to do. I went to work that day, and I typed in his name in the computer, and he wasn't there. There's only three possible reasons why his name wouldn't be there. One, he, he died, which I haven't heard anything about. Two, we sent him home, which that wasn't happening. We weren't sending anybody home from Guantanamo. <coughs> or three, he was moved to a different facility. Now, the best of my knowledge, I only knew of three facilities in Guantanamo at that point. There was Camp Delta, where I worked at, with the general population. There was Camp Iguana, which housed children. We had two 12-year-olds and a 13-year-old that we had in Camp Iguana. And then there was Camp Echo, which had the bad guys, which had the, the real tough ones, the real violent guys. He wasn't a violent man. He wasn't a tough man. He wasn't an angry person, so it wouldn't have made sense for us to send him there. And he wasn't a child, so it wouldn't have made sense for us to send him to where the children were. So it was just as if he had disappeared. And I started asking some of the other detainees, you know, where's Ahmed? Where, where did Erichini go? Where's Erichini? Where did he go? Where's Erichini? Finally, a detainee tells me that, that, that he had been moved and he had last seen him on S Block. So I went and I looked on S Block, and sure enough, a few days prior, he had been on S Block. And I started reviewing 